record. All right. So, hello everyone. Um, welcome to my humble abode. I will uh, be your guest tonight and I will be speaking about Transylvania and Gothic fiction and Gothic fiction in Transylvania. And if you were enticed here with the promise of vampires, because my quote is from Dracula, um, you've been already locked in this uh, space and in this imaginary geography. And I will emphasize the fact that my presentation deals mostly with Transylvania as an imaginary geography and less so with uh, vampires strictly. And also it will um, kind of uh, start debating why this real map space um, becomes entangled with Gothic visions. But to put the quote in context, in case you don't remember it, it was on page 26. It's when uh, Dracula introduces uh, his own uh, preferences for the spaces he inhabits. And he says, and I quote, I am glad that it is old and big. I myself am of an old family and to live in a new house would kill me. A house cannot be made habitable in a day. And after all, how few days go to make up a century I rejoice also that there is a chapel of old times. We Transylvanian nobles love not to think that our bones may be amongst the common dead. And uh, this is something we have to keep in mind as we go on. This idea that um, a new house, a new form would threaten these uh, old patterns and uh, how much uh, the Gothic relies on uh, hearkening back to a past shrouded in a uh, mystery shrouded in the mist hidden within uh, the woods, which is why I chose as the background this image of Bran Castle that a lot of you would associate with Dracula, even though um, the Voivod himself, Vladimir Impaler, who is supposed to have inspired this vision, doesn't really have any actual ties to the Bran Castle since he was actually born in Sikishara and he actually ruled Valachia to the south, which is mostly a world of plains and of uh, this, uh, this summer sun that never seems to set. So completely opposite. So how did we get here? Well, again, let's try to keep in mind this idea of uh, old forms threatening um, to burst open uh, if you try to pour in new content. Transylvania itself as the word is very peculiar because it doesn't really say what it is. It's a negative definition. It just tells you what it is not. So Transylvania from Latin actually just means beyond the forest. But even if you look at the other uh, words we know Transylvania by, like Erdeli, which inspired the Romanian word Ardeal, also just means uh, beyond the woods. Uh, Überwald in German, again, just beyond the woods. Uh, all three, uh, just to suggest this image of Transylvania as a terra incognita, something that uh, frustrates the imperialist uh, civilizing project, something that uh, cannot really be known. And even if you look at the maps themselves, this is a map from the 15th century, this is a map from the 16th century, uh, there is an emphasis more on these woods here uh, and on uh, the very presence of the Carpathian um, mountain range. So there's always uh, less of a focus on the actual human settlements here and uh, the artifacts that document their presence and more the idea that a human element once threatened, it can always retreat into the mountains. And the human element here is almost always seen as barely human, almost feral. And we'll get into that a bit later. But for those of you who aren't Romanian and um, aren't really sure how well, where to place Transylvania on the map. I'll just try to get you up to speed real quick and also to um, explain why it is such a hotly contested place. So as you can see here, the word uh, Dacia, uh, this was the pre-Roman uh, name for the area uh, where the Dacians who were part of the, well, Thracian family, which were a Celtic people who used to live. And uh, we know precious little about them because they didn't really leave any written records behind. Um, they a lot of them would have been bilingual because they were trading with the Greeks. So we would get information about them from the Greeks. Uh, a lot of it uh, very satirical uh, about their um, self-importance. 
uh, while the Romans would be even less favorable to the Dacians because they would be warring uh, on and off again. And uh, in the uh, second century, uh, Dacia would also be conquered by the Romans who would establish uh, administrative centers here. Um, and unlike other Roman provinces, uh, the people very readily assimilated into the Roman Empire, very readily took up the language. And once we have the Slavic migrations here and even the Asiatic and Germanic migrations, we notice that um, uh, even by Byzantine uh, sources speak of these people here again with a negative definition, not who they are, but who they are not. They are not Slavic in a sea of Slavic people. They are the only Romance culture there. And they will be called Vlach or Olach, um, but a lot of them would be mostly um, documented, again, by their artifacts and less by what they write. And uh, you see that, especially if you check uh, toponyms. So for example, you would have the very same uh, river uh, have a Slavic name in the plains, the Bistrica, which would uh, um, mean, uh, well, the quick river. And up the mountain where uh, the Vlachs would have retreated, it would be called Repedia, the very same river. And this pattern happens again and again. But why did I give the name for Transylvania in three different languages? Well, it's because Transylvania doesn't really have a streamlined Enlightenment era uh, story, uh, an, an origin story we can, where you can just simply uh, say, well, these are the people who live there, this is their language. It was always multicultural. So it was always uh, resisting this very neat uh, narrative. And uh, yes, you had the Blacks, like I just mentioned, but you also had the Hungarians who settled here in the uh, second half of the 10th century. And at first they were not Christian, but they did convert to Christianity in uh, 1000, in the year 1000 with uh, uh, Stephen I. And later on, they would also, uh, after the Great Schism, they would side with uh, the Catholic Church rather than the Christian Orthodox Church. The Vlachs would be Christian Orthodox. So that would immerse them even more into this Slavic culture. And indeed, they would be using the Cyrillic alphabet well into the 18th century. Um, and why did I add the German name for it? Well, because um, besides uh, the Hungarians here, there will also be um, German colonizers, Saxon colonizers, uh, up to this edge of the Carpathian Arc. And um, this is why this map doesn't just include the word Transylvania, it also says Siebenbürgen. Siebenbürgen meaning seven fortresses, seven Saxon fortresses. So when we speak about the Gothic, we have to bear in mind the fact that it is a Germanic mode. It also enters Transylvania as a foreign element. So most of the uh, Gothic architecture would have come through Germanic order, the Teutonic order, the Cistercian order. Even if we look at the very first instances of the Gothic in Romania, for example, uh, the church of Cisnadia, it would all have been Germanic. And we have to keep this in mind because this imperialist lens is uh, very fruitful when we discuss um, how Transylvania is represented. And also uh, when it comes to the issue of uh, self-representation, of uh, self-determination, this is, uh, well, the unified uh, heraldry of Transylvania. Of course, there are previous uh, versions we can find. Uh, yellow and red come up again and again, but sometimes this blue is replaced by green. Uh, however, in the 18th century, the um, Empress Maria Teresa uh, settles for this version, which um, parts harks back on um, the heraldry that was uh, suggested in the 16th century uh, once um, the three main ethnicities that had political rights chose to basically band together to crush the peasant rebels uh, that kept uh, bursting up again and again. Most of these peasants would have been illiterate blacks. And if you look even at uh, the stem itself, you have uh, the black eagle or the black raven uh, which would have stood for um, the Hungarian nobility. And if you think of the few Romanians that assimilated into Hungarian nobility, they would have done it also by converting to Catholicism. So if you think, for example, of uh, Jan de Hunedoara, um, if you think of the Corvin family, again, Corvin, Raven, you get the feel. And also you get the idea that this is um, a militant bird because of its position. 
it's uh, right by this red band. And this red band stands for um, the fortress wall. So it's uh, a raven that overlooks the fortress and has to protect it. Who is it protecting it against? Well, um, obviously all the Asianic tribes, uh, the Mongols especially, who would uh, be uh, burning uh, everything to the ground, um, but also against the peasants, because like I was saying, they kept rebelling on and off. Uh, in the background, you would have uh, usually uh, the sun and the moon, and you can see it here as well, the sun and the moon here, and the sun and the moon here, uh, that would stand for the Sekeli or Sekui. Uh, these were, um, it, the very word itself just means the frontier guards. So this would have been the, uh, the even more militarized um, faction that uh, some people speculated that they would have been Magyarized Turks. They themselves claim um, their legacy back from Attila the Hun. So if this is for the nobility that is defending the law, uh, the Sekeli are defending by sword. And another interesting thing, if you compare to uh, the actual representation of the Sekeli in, on the Hungarian uh, stem compared to the Romanian stem, uh, they keep the crescent moon and here you have a waxing moon. So already a question of whether they're gaining power or not. Uh, and here are the seven fortresses that would have stood for uh, the first most important uh, Saxon fortresses. And um, a lot of people would have latched onto this uh, blue background as a silent acknowledgement of the uh, Vlach majority, because uh, to the south, Wallachia, uh, which was also inhabited by mostly by Vlach, would have used uh, Azure flags a lot in battles. And um, when I speak about Transylvania, we have to bear in mind the fact that it's not a self-contained space. Yes, you do have the Carpathian uh, range mostly keeping it together, but you have to understand that with the, for with the forest and everything, um, there's a history of moving in between provinces, in between Transylvania and Moldavia to the east, or Transylvania and Valachia to the south, and indeed the history of uh, Romania is um, repeatedly described in the terms of dismountings, descalecări which is, just means a voivod uh, escaping a political rival by moving into another predominantly Vlach inhabited province. So this history isn't really that streamlined. You don't really have uh, um, any uh, modern narrative until significantly later on. So one of the reasons why uh, the Gothic is seen as such an alien feature is because they can't really look back on any beloved ruins. Uh, those ruins would have belonged to the German colonizers. And uh, even as we acknowledge this, we have to point out that the Middle Ages were significantly longer in Transylvania. So the Middle Ages would have uh, actually started around the 12th century so a century before Italy was kind of gearing up towards the Renaissance, but around the 12th century when most of the Asianic um, migrations would have uh, settled down a bit. And then only properly ends uh, at the end of the 16th century. That's a very long medieval age with very, very few documents left, a lot of them contested, a lot of them anonymous. Why the end of the 16th century? Because that's the first time the three provinces are unified uh, by uh, Michael the Brave, but that only lasts for about a year and then he dies. And uh, these three colors are taken up by Transylvanians arguing for their political rights. And in solidarity, um, the rest of the Vlachs and the other two provinces that will become the old kingdom under a German king again, um, will adopt these three colors. Uh, however, they will no longer have them uh, set up horizontally, they will set them up vertically, imitating the French. Uh, because by living behind the Germanic model, they are trying to claim um, almost sisterhood with the French. Um, and they are trying to latch on to that uh, Roman link as a claim to actually being civilized subjects who deserve rights. Now that I've clarified that, uh, this, is an Im this is a painting representing the May uh, 1848 um, gathering at uh, Blage. You can see these flags and uh, you can understand uh, why 
uh, this multicultural space uh, was very difficult to understand, even by Central Europeans, and why for so long it simply became the other of the West. And even as we already have these uh, main four ethnicities, of course, there is more uh, variety here. It is far more, uh, it is further north, but it's still very Balkan in feeling. So you have a significant Jewish population, you also have a significant Roma population, and this complicates uh, issues. But at the same time, it is a deeply superstitious place. So um, in the 18th century, you don't just have a lot of uh, political unrest, you also have a vampire craze sweeping, the, sweeping uh, Eastern Europe. So, so much so that in uh, 1766, the Hungarian Empress Maria Teresa that I mentioned before had to uh, formally forbid both witch hunts and vampire hunts. And she had to double down again two years later, forbidding the persecution of magical activity. Well, this doesn't mean that magic was effectively legal in Transylvania, not at all. It just means that people were no longer um, allowed to scapegoat their political or social enemies by accusing them of uh, witchcraft or by accusing them of vampirizing others, of uh, threatening their prosperity, uh, using dark magic. And then it's not so much of a surprise that in 1816 we have Lord Byron, John Polidori, who will write the vampire, uh, Priscilla Bishicelli, uh, Mary Goodwin Shelley, and Claire Caramont actually read some of these uh, Germanic accounts of vampirism. Uh, but again, as I was saying, all of this is seen through the eyes of an empire. All of this is always cast as the periphery. All of this is always cast as that, as that, as that which resists uh, a clean cut narrative. Um, you have here the names of the seven um, fortresses. And as you notice, half of them don't truly really sound the same in Romanian. Yes, Bistrița sounds like Bistrița, and uh, Mediash sounds like Mediash. Uh, personally, I'm from Cluj. Uh, Klausenburg doesn't really sound anything like that. And uh, Vladimir Piller was from Salzburg, the Gishara. And on to this. Uh, when do we first get um, representations of Transylvania outside of actual historic records? Well, one of the earliest uh, Western sources would be Shakespeare, but just in passing in Pericles. Uh, he just mentions a random Transylvanian getting killed in the market. That's it, just as a victim. Nothing else about him. Um, otherwise, uh, the Germans uh, would have dramatized the Ostsiedlung of the 12th century, uh, the move eastwards in uh, the song of the Pied Piper. So there's always this idea uh, that you can expand towards east, but the east will always resist you a bit. And it will resist you a bit also because of its proximity to the Ottoman Empire. And a lot of uh, Transylvanian history is defined by how they resist this um, expansion of the Ottoman Empire that also threatened the limits of Vienna. Uh, so Transylvania isn't just the margin, uh, isn't just a whirlpool of uh, centrifugal forces where you can't really accumulate anything because uh, everything is always uh, threatened by a peasant revolt and then they just retreat into the woods. It's even more so than that, it's a portal. It's a portal between the West and the East. And uh, Vladimir Paler himself, um, who ruled in the uh, mid uh, 15th century, uh, even though he ruled Wallachia, he had quite a vendetta against uh, the German merchants in Transylvania. So there would have been uh, repeated raids and that would have, uh, of course, attracted their wrath. And how did they respond? Well, so it was a soft power. So you see here a contemporary engraving where you have Vladimir and Paler uh, casually admiring uh, his victims, uh, suffering for days on end, uh, impaling to ages. And it also took a lot of skill. The point was not to kill them immediately. Uh, you may think of fangs um, piercing their bodies when you see this image, but you have to understand that the edge of uh, that pillar would have actually been uh, basically lubed with uh, pig fat in a, a lot of cases. And uh, the executioner would have had to have quite uh, the significant knowledge of human anatomy to avoid any major organ and any major damage as that pillar pierces their body. 
So uh, in this image, you see it's coming through their stomachs. Uh, that's not quite accurate. It would usually enter uh, their body through their rear and it would exit through their mouth so that they would be offered to the ravens uh, as live bait. And as you see him uh, eating and just not even averting his uh, gaze, um, it's just uh, the immediate jump uh, into saying that he was effectively drinking their blood, uh, just as Erzsébet Bathory, the uh, bloody contest, a Hungarian bloody contest, who was supposed to have uh, had uh, 600 uh, maidens killed so she could use their blood um, to give herself uh, young forever. Um, but this isn't just, uh, well, Saxon propaganda. Even uh, other sources suggest that if he saw any of his noblemen avert their gaze from this uh, cruel spectacle, he would have them join them. So he did not like anyone um, hesitating. He was a very vengeful um, voivod. And he was also a member of the Order of the Dragon, which uh, his own father uh, had joined. Um, the Order of the Dragon was uh, founded by uh, the Holy Roman uh, Emperor uh, Sigismund of Luxembourg, uh, again, to contain the Ottoman expansion threat. And the Order of the Dragon would also have them uh, wear a cape that was a black cape lined with red. And if you think that sounds a lot like Dracula, that is one of the few things that makes uh, them be connected. And, but if we look here at a later uh, representation, about a century later, also a German source, uh, we see him take uh, the role not of uh, a disciple of Christ uh, containing the Muslim threat to European civilization. Instead, we see him as an agent of Satan, uh, an agent that takes the place of Pontius Pilate, and instead he victimizes Christ, and he smirks while he does that. So there is this movement between uh, being seen as Vlad Draculia, or the son of the dragon, to being seen as Vlad Dracul, Vlad the devil. Um, it's a nice co linguistic coincidence, but one that will be exploited uh, by those who resented him. And this will taint the image uh, uh, the Germans have of Transylvania. And uh, even the very uh, feeble connections some people have claimed between uh, Vladimir Impaler and uh, the Brand Castle, uh, claiming that he was imprisoned there by Hungarians, it's more likely that he was actually imprisoned around Budapest. And again, the Budapest is mostly, uh, Hungary is mostly plains, so that doesn't really mesh with Gothic visions. But the German Schroeder novel uh, retains this uh, idea of Transylvania as a place where you go to die and you go to die a violent death and uh as we keep this in mind we also have to not forget that he threatened the fortunes of others which he needed for his military exploits it wasn't just sense of violence however as gothic fiction uh bubbles up in short bursts whenever um someone's uh, finances are threatened whenever uh, conventional morality is threatened. We have to understand uh, Gothic visions of Transylvania, especially as something that frustrates uh, the Protestant work ethic. So as I was saying earlier, Hungarians would have mostly been Catholic, but after um, um, the pro after the reform, some of them would have become Calvinist, some of them would have become Unitarian. Um, but the Vlachs would have stayed mostly Orthodox, um, which is something they would have had more in common with the Slavic population in the Balkans. So they're already heretical, they're already cruel, they're already smirking, smirking their way through a decadent lifestyle, according to the Empire. And uh, according to later uh, travel writers, for example, uh, the Scottish writer uh, Emily Gerard, who was uh, married to an Austro-Hungarian officer, so again, this is true, the eyes of the empire, she discussed in an article uh, Transylvania being uh, the land of superstition for no one else does this curious crooked plant of delusion flourish as persistently and in such bewildering variety. It would almost seem as though the whole species of demons, pixies, witches, and hobgoblins, driven from the rest of Europe by the want of science, had taken refuge within this mountain rampart, well aware that here they would find secure lurking places, whence they might defy their persecutors yet a while.
again, the idea that if you go to Transylvania, you go there to retreat into the woods, you go there to retreat beyond the forest and to escape justice because there's little justice here. So there's definitely here what uh, Max Konkan would later term uh, geography of fear, but uh, this influences a general view of uh, Transylvania as a superstitious place where it, the enlightenment didn't really take root. So even as we look then at uh, self-representation, none of this rings true anymore because uh, there is this orientalist lens where Transylvanians see themselves as the last bastion of Western culture against, again, Ottoman expansion. So instead of seeing themselves as trans, uh, centrifugal or how uh, Jules Verne uh, describes uh, the place as a whirlpool with, uh, where all the darkness uh, pulls in and there's barely any air and light coming from civilization, they see themselves as centripetal. So they see themselves as um, crystallizing together uh, the best ideas from German culture, uh, the best ideas that they can gain from uh, French culture because they're closer to it and a lot of uh, um, important uh, Transylvanian public figures would have completed their education in France and then come back. Uh, but they also don't see themselves as a relic of the past. So if in a lot of God of fiction, we see Transylvania more or less frozen in time in the 19th century, it doesn't really go past that. Uh, Transylvanians see themselves more as open towards the future or more as urinal. So this would be the kind of images you would find if you looked up, not Transylvania, but Adagal, the Romanian word for it. So it's the, this is part of the draw. The way they even uh, market themselves, even in politics, is that they're more Western than their counterparts in Moldavia and Wallachia. Never mind that these three provinces will always cooperate. Uh, and more so than that, uh, it isn't just that Transylvania refuses to term itself tumultuous, uh, violent, passionate, vengeful, and all of that kind of Gothic affect. Instead, the word that is most closely associated with Ardeal is actually Tihnit. Tihnit is um, a Transylvanian term that means at once uh, quiet, slow paced, uh, self-sufficient. So there is this very pastoral vision that is being conjured, this very bucolic vision that here the peasantry is just uh, living its slow life, its good life, and history is happening elsewhere. So even if you look at literature that came about the same time as uh, Gothic vampires were tormenting the West, um, the images are very, very different. So for example, in Wara Kunorok, uh, the water mill of good fortune, what we see is uh, a family that has a very technique lifestyle. And um, the protagonist, the husband, risks it all uh, just for class mobility. And the way he achieves it is through dishonest means uh, by falling to the lure of an almost Byronic anti-hero, Lika Samadawl, who is almost a bit of a cowboy figure in these mountains. Uh, and this will come up again uh, when I discuss uh, cinematic representations. This idea of uh, Transylvania as a no man's land uh, that's not so different from uh, the frontier in the United States. And uh, all these diurnal images of uh, the happy family with the young children who settle in the middle of nowhere trying to make a life for themselves, uh, it quickly goes wrong uh, once uh, the protagonist uh, Gita is uh, lured and corrupted by money. And then we have uh, significant scenes taking place during a stormy night. Then we have the wife get sedu seduced uh, by uh, Lika Sabadol. Then we have uh, the police officers trying to follow him into the mountains. We have uh, murder, we have suicide. We are fully in the Gothic now. And the only ones who make it out alive are the only ones left uncorrupted, the children and the grandmother who had warned against um, being corrupted by money. And poetry at the time would have also insisted on this pastoral mode uh, because the draw is no longer the Germanic model. The draw now is towards reclaiming the uh, Latin aspect, uh, looking back again onto the bucolic, again to claim that they are civilized subjects who are deserving of political rights. But if we look actually at the history of uh, this literature, um, 
it's again a fragment in and of itself. When I say a tale and imitation of the German, I'm alluding, of course, to uh, Edgar Allan Poe's short story that uh, is set in Transylvania, even though he's more concerned there with Hungarian families. But if we look at literature in Romanian, we won't really find much. Like I said, they would have used Slavic in uh, religious rites, and they would have used Cyrillic uh, alphabet for a long, long time. And actually, the very first uh, documentary source we have of Romanian language in and of itself is from the early 16th century and it's a letter and all it does is warn against uh, Ottoman military expansion in the south. Again, uh, being caught between multiple empires means that there's very little self-definition and more of this uh, defensive stance. Uh, but why do I have this other year in the brackets? That's because even though this is an extremely old letter, it was rediscovered at the end of the 19th century when Romanians were taking the claim that actually we want those three provinces to be together again. Um, it was an Austrian philologist who discovered it and said, oh yes, Romanian actually is a language. Uh, these people didn't just uh, come up out of the caves into uh, modernity. They have been here a long time. They just haven't really been noticed by history. And even if we look at software presentations, uh, a lot of them would have taken very, very seriously and to heart this representation of uh, Vlach as being almost subhuman. So for example, Dimitri Kantemir, even though he's Moldavian, he would have interacted a lot with Transylvanian novels, a lot with Vlachian novels. And um, he wrote Historia Hieroglifico, which even by the cover, you can tell it's much more Baroque. Uh, it really looks like uh, the Gothic never happened here. It's much more Oriental. Uh, it means uh, the history in hieroglyphs. And why is it called that? Because none of the characters are human. All of the characters are animals, but this is not the fable. Uh, all the animals are taken from her heraldry. So it's a novel with the key, uh, Roman Nakhlef. And it's very Game of Thronesy in uh, its vibe, in its plot. Um, you have all these warring factions uh, that are squabbling amongst themselves while the greater threat in the South is growing. And Jan Budai de Lano, who was uh, in the 18th century part of the so called uh, Scuola uh, Ardeliana, the Transylvanian school that was uh, arguing. Um, towards the em uh, emperor that uh, Vlach would also uh, be deserving of representation. And indeed, there are several memorandums of this kind. They're usually always tried for treason and sent to prison for doing so. He wrote Tiganiada. And Tiganiada was uh, meant to be uh, the third um, the third epic after the Iliad and the Enid, again, uh, this attachment to Roman and Greek models, this claim towards civilization, except it's also very humorous, uh, just like uh, history in hieroglyphs. It has a very uh, serious um, subject, but there's all, it's always infused with uh, Balkan humor. And the title itself, um, the only way to translate it is honestly the Gypsyad. And what it does is uh, it has this, setting where at the time of Vladimir Paler, here he comes up again, um, he wants to contain the Ottoman threat, of course. So he commissions um, Roma people to fight for him. And uh, the interesting thing is that Roma people, unfortunately, were chattel slaves for a very long time. And uh, many uh, poets would have actually raised this topic and argue for their personhood as well. I'm thinking of Vasil Alexandri, for example. Um, there is the idea that they are at the same level as Vlachs. Vlachs wouldn't have been uh, slaves. They would have been feudal serfs. Uh, but neither are recognized as fully, fully human, neither are recognized as European subjects. So in both cases, uh, there is a sort of gallows humor uh, that takes up uh, the accusations that would come from the executor, that you're not quite fully human. And they're both tales of failure. Uh, both epics fail in actually achieving uh, their um, purported uh, goal, but it's always treated with humor. It's always accepted that, yes, failure and the circular history is just 
it's just a thing here. You don't really have linear history. Um, there is a draw towards it in the 19th century, though, especially because of Edgar Allan Poe. So Livia Cotro, for example, in the Sight of Time, uh, discusses how Poe was the one who introduced the Gothic mode to Transylvanians and to Romanians. How? Through Charles Baudelaire, like I said. Um, they wouldn't, uh, Transylvanians wouldn't have really cared much for English uh, language sources, but they would have loved French language sources. And Poe was immediately translated. Um, the, the very first translation would have been The Pit in the Pendulum in uh, 1861, so pretty fast, and it immediately uh, gathered uh, six other versions. And um, this would have played a lot in uh, how they define uh, the Gothic. The Gothic would no longer be so much so tied to folklore and would uh, achieve these uh, connotations of uh, the great old family and the great old house that is now a ruin. That wouldn't have ring, it wouldn't ring true for their own experience, but it would ring true to the Poe model, which was a tale in an imitation of the German. And I don't want to uh, ignore the fact that, yes, there are a great many superstitions in Transylvania. There is some truth to some travelers um, pointing this out, uh, but a lot of them would be misrepresented, to be honest. So it's less so the dead interfering with the living, um, strictly so, and it's more the living interceding on behalf of the dead, especially if they failed to help the dead um, transition into the afterlife uh, seamlessly. So um, you wouldn't necessarily have actual vampires as we think of them now. Um, well, every single culture has their own version of the vampire from Latin America to China. Uh, but what we think of as Dracula would be closer to uh, the Assyrian prehistoric model that may have arrived in the Balkans through Turkey. So again, they always blame the Ottomans. And um, what they find here is actually uh, three different uh, e entities uh, with three different backstories. You would find Moroi, Srigoi, and Pikolic. Uh, Moroi would mostly be unbaptized infants who are torturing their careless parents, uh, especially uh, sucking the lifeblood of uh, the mother that failed them. You would have Srigoi who are threatening uh, the good fortune of their neighbors. They're either making uh, the cow's milk uh, run dry um crops fail or, or they're the only ones in the village who are blessed with good fortune the only ones who manage to multiply apply their fortunes uh, and when they die uh they keep on feeding off the living and uh unlike the moroi sigoi sometimes would be seen as predestined to become so so it's not just that whether you have a violent death especially by your own hand or if you die from a witch's curse you can become a Srigoi if you are simply the seventh child of the same gender in a family, or if you lead the life of sin, or if you die without being married. So, um, Pikolich, however, would be almost shape shifters. They would be able to turn into cats. No, they would not be uh, werewolves. Those would be Vrkolach. Uh, but Pikolich would be these very hyperactive children um, to the point that the people would be very suspicious of them. How do they have this much energy? They must be vampirizing from them. And often enough, you would be able to tell if someone was indeed uh, a Srigoi, for example, if you were to unearth them. And uh, you have instances of whole villages just picking up everything and moving across the hills to escape the Moroi, the, the Srigoi, or the Pikolic. For example, there's a case of Salishne, which was completely abandoned in the 18th century, and uh, all the villagers um, established a new human settlement called Guraraculi in Dolj. It's not Transylvania, but again, these uh, things permeate beyond hard limits. Um, and the elders would still insist that they had to escape the Moroi and the Strigoi, but historic records show that at the time that they moved, it was because of a plague. It was uh, Chumali Karaja. So the graveyards would have been uh, full to the brim and they, they would have threatened the actual health of the people there. So these, uh, there, there's this idea of trying to offer a supernatural uh, explanation for something that is perfectly natural but they did not know at the time. Uh, you see here this garland of garlic um, at the window. 
Uh, it's not just for vampires, but also against werewolves. And I'm already issuing a warning for you for uh, next Sunday. The next Sunday is the 29th of November, which is uh, St. Uh, Andrew's uh, Day. Well, St. Andrew's Night, more precisely, uh, the patron saint of Romania that is supposed to have um, Christianized uh, Greeks and then, of course, the Greek influence here. But he's also the patron saint of wolves. And uh, he's also protecting against the undead that come when the veil is thin. So this would be the Romanian version of uh, Halloween. And uh, there's always something half seductive about these undead. Um, for example, even though most of the Gothic uh, fiction that circulates in uh, Transylvania would be between the end of the 19th century, thanks to Pope, and uh, mid 20th century, because uh, what's become a socialist republic, uh, the Gothic was seen alongside fantasy as an immature genre, um, you still have certain bursts of it. For example, Marin Sorescu wrote, um, La Liliech, a volume of poetry inspired by these um, folk, uh, by, by this kind of uh, very grim folklore uh, in the village where he grew up. And La Liliech can be translated in two ways. It can be translated as uh, where the lilac bushes are or where the bats are. And if you thought it's where the bats are, you would actually be wrong uh, because he's describing um, the graveyard in his home village that would have these uh, very fragrant, intoxicating and alluring uh, lilac bushes that will call you out to visit them at night. And uh, when you go out at night, sometimes you actually meet a strigoi, as he does in the poem uh, Dumneata, um, which is just a polite form of you. And uh, there's always this kind of uh, ecology that has to be kept, you have to stay away from the undead because it can contaminate you. In the Nata, the dead uh, is uh, instigating you. The Sriko is telling you, grab me by the collar and see if it's me. But if you grab him by the collar, your hand can fall off. So let the dead bury the dead. And as Joy says, let the dead marry the dead. Um, some people would uh, point towards uh, happier versions of the afterlife, especially in Transylvania, for example, the Mary Cemetery of Saplinsa. And you can see here these naive paintings of the dead. You can see the very bright colors. You can see that they have poems about their lives. A lot of them would uh, be very humorous. They would uh, say, oh, Vasile, you were such a drunk. Finally, you're off the drink that you're dead. Um, but this is actually a retconning the Transylvanian vision of the afterlife, I'm sorry to say. So even though there are 800 of such crosses, um, they would have, uh, the first one would have been painted in 1933 because an artist was influenced by a Romanian historian who was saying, uh, let's stop claiming uh, the um, Roman model of civilization, let's stop looking at France, let's start looking inward, let's start looking at the pre-Roman um, civilization that we had here, the Dacians, who were supposed to be happy about dying and joining the Maltese. So this doesn't ring true. What rings true actually is Colivo, and this is the Greek spelling because it was, again, pre-Roman as well. And uh, this is made by boiling arpakash, uh, which is just uh, the byproduct, leftover husks uh, of any grains when you make uh, flour. Uh, so it's very cheap, it's uh, very accessible, and it's very sweet. And the point of it is to be uh, the personal equivalent to the uh, Eucharist. So instead of eating of Christ and drinking his blood, again, cannibalism, again, again a vampiric uh, ritual that doesn't really make that much sense uh, to the Germans, uh, Koliva would uh, give you the taste of the sweetness of the afterlife, but it also would give you a taste of the sweetness of the life of the deceased. So it's almost like you're eating the dead, and you're also almost like you're uh, getting a taste of yourself when you will be dead, because uh, uh, these husks of our pakash are supposed to all, um, and, and because there are thousands of them in one slice, uh, they're supposed to make you think of you being a part of the greater community. So this is the opposite of what Dracula was saying in Bram Stoker uh, about not wanting to be alongside the commoners. The commoners would want to be together in this very cannibal uh, vision. So uh, this is a place of superstition. And these instances uh, start getting crowded closer and closer together of Transylvania as this uh, place with uh, dramatic valleys, with um, 
foggy uh, woods uh, with castles, uh, no sighting of the villages. Or is that so? Well, Nosferatu himself, uh, again, this is a German movie which had a limited um, reception because of Bram Stoker's widow. Um, he doesn't look seductive. He's not a Byronic hero. He looks almost animal-like. Uh, unfortunately, there's also a bit of uh, anti-Semitism that could have tainted this vision, uh, the image of Jews as vampires. Uh, so, and, and also he's inhabiting, his Transylvania is very barren. He is uh, bleeding dry, the area. Uh, Bela Lugosi's uh, Transylvania is more Hungarian instead. Even uh, the peasants that we see, they speak Hungarian. We have signs in Hungarian. So it's the same place, but it's already a little more lively. Uh, at the end of the day, though, there are still imaginary geographies. We don't really see the blocks. If we want to see the blocks, there is the 2005 volume by Valentina Glajar and Dominica Rodolescu, Vampirettes, Wretches, and Amazons, Western Representations of East European Women. Uh, but most of the time, uh, Transylvanians are seen as aliens, like in the Rocky Horror Picture Show, where Transylvania is actually a galaxy. And these people are very weird, they're very decadent, and they almost have a hive mind of their own, though, which makes them even more dangerous. But there's always a question, not of whether they're dead or alive or whatever binaries they may be unsettling. It's always the question of whether they are persons or not. This is an image from um, Terry Pratchett's uh, This World. So again, Uberwald. Are these people, are these creatures existing in a liminal space even people? Are they even comprehensible? Well, in Romanian uh, literature, uh, a lot of it would have come through the folklore tradition, the Gothic uh, seen through the eyes of superstition, uh, having rituals against them um, mandated by the church. Some of them, though, are pagan. For example, uh, Koliva, to be effective, you have to wash the Arpakash in nine different uh, waters, just as to clean your house, uh, preparing for the night St. Andrews, you have to clean your windows nine different times with nine different waters. But you see these stars here, these are authors who would have translated Poe and then would have taken him as an example. And one way to avoid the lure of uh, this uh, almost satanic uh, vampiric vision is uh, actually by siding with the commoners. So even the evening star by Mihaly Unescu, you have the evening star that tries to seduce the emperor's daughter and the way she resists him and refuses to join him in the galaxy and to let him vampirize her is by choosing uh, a servant at her court whose name is just the masculine form of her own name. So there's this sameness, this sense of community that is the way to um, undo this uh, threat. Uh, Michael Eliades, Domishara Cristina, and you can tell by the way her name is spelled, it's different than mine, that there is something alien about her. You don't really spell Christina in Romanian with an H uh, because nobility is seen as foreign. So uh, the novella uses as a departing point the 1907 peasant revolt where the peasants draw blood from the nobles that would have been exploiting them. And uh, this young noblewoman, deadly for her time, stalks uh, the property and she wants to vampirize her own family. And there's something very statuesque about this. So if uh, the folkloric versions of um, the vampire would have been a peasant coming upon their own family. Uh, the Poe version of the vampire uh, would elevate it to this aristocratic mode. Even if you look at the film poster itself, there's something statuesque about her. She's almost a ruin. She's not just a corpse oozing these uh, uh, bodily fluids and disgusting you. No, instead, she's almost becoming uh, inanimate. She's almost becoming an object, but a sex object. Uh, there is still a certain gothic effect, even if we look at Transylvania seen outside of vampire narratives. So, uh, for example, uh, the only author born, in, born and raised in Romania who's ever won the Nobel Prize for Literature, Hertha Müller, and you can tell by her name that she's German, she has a very dark vision of Transylvania. Um, and that is also because of her own family's uh, experience. So her grandfather would have been a, a large landowner and a lot of his property would have been seized. Uh, her father was an SS um, soldier. So uh, as you can imagine, there was this question of vengeance. Uh, and uh, 
there's this her image of Transylvania is a carceral image. Again, that geography of fear I was alluding to. This idea that Transylvania is littered with gulags and uh, there are vengeful people who attack the Germans. So for example, even in um, the king bows down and kills, uh, it's not an actual king. It's about the whole uh, secret um, police uh, apparatus in the Republic, but it's cast as if being royalty that uh, demands blood. Um, this wouldn't be uh, the main, um, necessarily the main vision in the Romanian new wave of cinema. Uh, it would be more um, an enclosed vision where everything is a hospital, where uh, everybody has a certain sickness, nobody can really ever heal from it. Uh, it's very Kafkaesque in a sense as well. If you've watched, for example, uh, the death of Mr. Lazarescu, there's always a bit of humor, but it's always gallows humor. You always know that it's not going to end well. Uh, this still is taken from uh, Scarred uh, Heart, um, which uh, uh, adapted Max uh, Blecher's story. So again, uh, the Jewish uh, vision of Transylvania would have been very different from the German vision of uh, Transylvania, especially since unfortunately 130,000 uh, Jewish and Roma people would have been deported uh, when, Trans when Transylvania, or well, actually Romania at large, was collaborating with the Nazi regime. And even if you look at another uh, marginal perspective on Transylvania, uh, you have Roma people. For example, Aglaia Veterani, uh, who was raised in a circus family and they escape Romania and they start touring Germany. Her uh, vision in uh, why the child is uh, cooking into the polenta, again, a vision not unlike that of Ipin Colivo, is that of uh, a world of dark fairy tales um, and uh, of threats you can't really understand and of families with very unhealthy desires and relationships. Again, very gothic, but not you don't really see a vampire because the vampire isn't needed to make Transylvania gothic. Uh, but can you ever go beyond the vampire? You can, but you can't really. Even if you look at My Fair Lady, you have the Queen of Transylvania. Transylvania never really had a queen. Um, the very first queen of Romania, though, in the 1880s would have been German, married to a German king as well. And her literary pseudonym was Carmen Silva. Again, that means the song of the forest. Always this connection between Transylvania and Romania at large with the Carpathians. Uh, but having an aristocrat, a queen of Transylvania, there's again, something very Poe-esque about it. Uh, and when I mentioned before the watermill of good fortune and uh, the cowboy imagery in uh, Transylvania, well, in the 60s and 70s, you would have had the red westerns. Um, so you would have had a series straight up called Transylvanians. And uh, if you look at other Western images of Transylvania uh, that would, well, shock most people, in the late 90s uh, and, and until the mid 2000s, uh, American evangelist uh, Christians uh, had the series left behind where the Antichrist is called the uh, Nikolai Carpathian. So uh, that's not subtle at all. Here we have instead um, basically a socialist leader cast as uh, the Antichrist who is bleeding the West dry. So you can take distance, the distance in Beyond the Forest as a trope and play it straight. You can have all of these characters that have loose ties with Transylvania uh, just because they're vampires. Everything is translated immediately. I've actually uh, added here the titles in Romanian just so that you can see there is an appetite in Transylvania for writings about Transylvania and about vampires in general. It doesn't really matter the quality of that particular young adult fiction uh, novel. It's going to get translated maybe even the very same year. Uh, but uh, local efforts to write in that mode have failed. For example, uh, Beyond the Night, 12 Faces of the Gothic, again, beyond the impossibility of defining the place, came on the heels of uh, a steampunk uh, Romanian anthology that did much better. And as you can tell by the cover, it played the tropes straight, which is why by not having a local flavor, it just was too derivative to have any anything to draw people in. However, if you look at Beyond the Hills, this is much darker. This was inspired by a real incident um, that actually happened in Moldavia. Uh, but it's it's a story of two childhood friends. The two of them meet in an orphanage. They develop a very um, 
close-knit relationship they're, they're not really aware of how much they love each other and what kind of love they share until one of them uh goes to a monastery and uh she is subjected to an exorcism and the other one tries to help her escape the monks um but it but there is this uh, this disease narrative of uh, lesbian love as a disease, the question of whether exorcism itself um, ignores mental illness. Uh, again, the carceral hospital-like space of the monastery, it's much more gothic than this, and it also did better. But if you can beat them, sometimes you just have to join them. Sometimes if you can't argue against these visions of Transylvania, what you do is you exploit the simulacrum. So you can even find uh, Hotel Dracula if you ever go to uh, the Tihuta mountain pass. Um, it's not built on an uh, older Saxon fortress. It was actually just built in 1918, uh, 1981 with the express uh, goal of drawing in tourists. That's it. And you also have young adult fiction uh, writers in Romania, like Christina Nemirovsky, who is known as always exploiting the Gothic mode with mixed results, who wrote the trilogy uh, The Last Witch of Transylvania. And you can tell you by the cover that's a very Germanic model. And even if you look at all the other instances of Transylvania in movies and video games and whatnot, it's always the idea that this is a liminal space. Hotel Transylvania, it's not a village, it's not a place you can live, it's a hotel. And a hotel is a non-place, just as prisons, just as hospitals, just as all of these beyond places. And at the end of the day, it is an imaginary space more so than a real one, which is why it's so difficult to find uh, sci-fi visions of Transylvania. You have a lot of the Gothic, and I want us to get to see more interesting versions of the gothic that that use transylvanian models thank you for your attention thank you very much um are you okay to stop sharing christina yeah thank you